Morning! Welcome back. This is part 9 of my build log of the Trumpeter 1-200 scale model of the Titanic. In today's episode, we're doing lots of things really. It's a bit of a mishmash, so I won't dilly-dally. So without any further messing around, let's crack on. So today I'm wanting to do some weathering. Um, and to test out a few ideas before I pop them on the actual hull, I've created just a simple test piece with some spare black paint, exactly the same paint that I used on the hull. Uh, and what I'm going to use this for is just to try out a few different ideas. Um, weathering is, I think it's probably one of the most fun bits of modelling, but it's also one of the easiest bits to get wrong because the temptation is always to go a little bit too far. And it's amazing how fine the line is between something that looks really good and something that looks obviously overdone. And I'm conscious, particularly on this model, where she's pretty much a new ship, I'm going to have to be very, very careful to not overdo it. Um, so I'm looking at really fine techniques, things like tiny little bits of rust streaking where the, uh, where the, um, where the anchors are. And really, the only other thing I want to achieve other than that is just a little bit of difference across the hull so it doesn't just look like a complete matte black. Um, I'd like to have a little bit of variance in the colour across the hull because, of course, in reality, when you've got a 252 metre long ship, the hull isn't going to look completely uniform black. You know, um, if you look at it, if you're looking at it from far enough away to see the entire ship in your eye line, you're going to have shadows cast upon it. Um, the sunlight's going to reflect upon it differently. So. You know, have it, having a model that is completely matte black is actually not going to look particularly realistic. So you do want a bit of sort of colour variance across the hull. So that's the sort of thing I'm trying to achieve here. So here I'm using a clean rag and I'm applying a wash that I made which is primarily just paint thinner um, with a few drops of a very deep blue and a few drops of white as well. So this is my second layer. Because the colour is so thin, it's really easy to build up the layers very slowly and it just makes it that little bit harder to accidentally do too much weathering.
So I'm at the halfway point now. Um, I've washed half of the hull with this sort of whitish blue wash. Um, there's quite a lot of dust flecks on the hull, so don't worry, they're not part of the paint. Uh, and you'll probably just be able to tell that the wash is there. It's very, very subtle. Um, this is the side that's been washed, and you can just see, I don't even know if the camera will show it as well as it is in reality, but there's, there's just a tiny, tiny sort of tinge of grey in the black now, rather than it being pure black. And there's a tiny little bit of variation in the colour along the length of the hull. That's exactly what I'm after. If we go over to the other side, you can see how on this side, it feels a lot more uniform down the length. The black is, it's, it's almost like a pitch black. Um, and for me, I just think that's not quite realistic enough. So here I'm doing a technique called dry brushing. Dry brushing is when you add an amount of paint to your brush and then remove most of it on a scrap piece of paper so you end up with a dry brush. Um, you can then use that tiny little residue that's left on the brush to actually decorate your model. Here I'm using a mixture of a reasonably bright orange and then a very sort of dulled down fireplace red to achieve a rust streak. So this is the port side of the ship and I am deliberately not doing a huge amount of weathering on this side because I wasn't aware of this at all but um, one of the viewers wrote a comment in the previous video saying make sure that you don't do as much weathering on the port side because the White Star Line actually repainted Titanic's port side for her maiden voyage because this was the side that was facing Southampton Dock. So it's a really interesting little fact actually and I, I, I never would have known about it but I, did, I, I googled it later and you're absolutely right. Um, so I'm deliberately trying to add this detail in, so thank you very much for telling me that. Love this elevator music, by the way. Um, so this is the starboard side, uh, so I'm going to be a little bit more heavy with the weathering on this side, but still keeping it relatively light. It's really hard to get the camera to capture the subtlety of the wash on the hull because uh, it is so discreet, but I promise you it is there and it does look really nice in my opinion. 
Last little decorative job on the hull was to add the additional portholes which weren't included in the kit's mould. Uh, so I used some masking tape to make a centre line using the existing portholes as a guide. Uh, I then centre punched the holes and finally drilled them with my hand drill. So I'm now onto the final part of my paint, um, and this is where I will use the enamel varnish. Um, but before I can do that, you can see that just by having it in the house, a lot of dust has built up on the surface of the model. So before I put any paint near this, I need to get rid of all that. As always, make sure you wear a good mask when you're doing this. You really don't want to be breathing in enamel paint. Um, so that's it now. That's the hull pretty much all done. The enamel paint's a lot more hard wearing than acrylic, so that should hopefully protect the weathering and the paint job pretty well. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is how I cast the stanchions for my propeller shafts. So I started off by making these frames out of very thin acrylic. Uh, and I wrap them around the propeller shafts with a suitable hole to allow the propeller shafts to go all the way through. I then use CA glue and a CA glue catalyst to hold them in place, essentially the same principle as a spot weld, uh, and then I used hot glue to actually make a proper seal on them. For reference, this is the same epoxy that I'll use later on in the video when casting my lifeboats, so I'll say how to actually mix it and use it then. As you can see, I've had some leakage, um, and it's quite difficult to tell what is leakage and what isn't, because a lot of what looks like leakage is actually the hot glue, which I've been using to sort of 
I guess for want of a better word, waterproof the um, the casting squares anyway. But you can see there is some leakage here. You, know, you can just see if I do that, there's a bit of resin on the stick. Um, and so what I've been doing, because the resin's quite thick to start with, um, so the leakage hasn't been massive, but what I've been doing is just every half hour or so, I've been um, coming back uh, and just scraping as much of the leakage as I can back into the casts. Uh, and as, as the, uh, the curing process goes on, the leakage will become less and less. Now, I should say, I did sort of foresee this, and I did test out these casting sort of caissons beforehand with water. But of course, it's a quite a difficult, it's a difficult thing to work out because water has so much of a lower viscosity than the resin that water was running out of these quite quickly. But I estimated that because of the viscosity of the resin, it would probably leak out incredibly slowly. Um, and I was sort of half right, but half not. There's probably been a little bit more leakage than I'd wanted, but it's also not disastrous. You know, ultimately, this is a functional area of the boat. There's no need for it to look attractive. It's going to get covered in oil and stuff as these propellers start spinning more regularly. So, you know, aesthetics on this part of the ship are really not important. It's all about functionality. So here's the finished result. I had to be quite aggressive to get the acrylic and the hot glue off, but they've set absolutely rock hard so they will support the propeller shafts really well and hopefully thin down some of those vibrations. So my next job is to tap the inside of these propellers. So first of all I need to drill out a hole and then I need to tap the hole. So from looking at the Zeus guide you can see that a four millimeter thread requires a 3.3 millimeter drill bit. So we'll drill the hole with that, and then we'll use an M4 tap to finish off. For this particular process, I'm also gonna use a depth gauge because it would be a bit of a disaster if I drilled too deep and chopped the end off the propeller. So I've set the depth gauge so that there's gonna be enough of a thread on the propeller to hold it securely, but not so much of a hole that will cut through into the other side of the propeller. So the next thing I'm going to do is my tapping of the propellers. Um, tapping seems to be a little bit of an art form to me, and um, sadly it's an art form that I've never really been much good at. Um, I seem to, I, I wonder if it's just because I don't do it very often, so you know, I, I sort of learn it when I do it and then I give myself enough time to forget all of what I learned for the next time that I come to do it, you know? Um, I suspect also I, in the past, have gone a bit too fast, and uh, <laughs> about a pound for every time I've been told that, I'd be a rich person. But anyway, um, so yeah, we're going to tap these propellers. Uh, so I've got three different taps to use. First is the taper tap, and that's got, I don't know if you can really see, but it's got a nice taper um, on the top of the tap, which allows you to get into the workpiece early. Um, then I've got a plug tap, which widens out the threads at the bottom of the hole. And then finally, a bottoming tap here which is to finish off. So I'm going to do it in three stages.
Because the holes in the propellers aren't very deep, I'm having to remove some of the, the end of the threaded bar, which is the propeller shaft. Um, to do this, I'm just using a junior hacksaw. Um, you notice, though, that I've left the nut on the threads, and the reason for this is whenever you saw off anything with a thread on it, the saw will damage the thread at the end, so it's important that you leave a nut on, so that as you take that nut off, it realigns the threads properly. So, the next job I'm going to do is to use a thread locker on the join between the propellers and the propeller shafts. This is a common thread locker that's used all over the place, Loctite 243. It's a really good product, I've used it many a time before. We also use it where I work, um, so it's, it's industry sort of approved, I guess, as well as just for use in models. Um, the reason that I need this thread locker is essentially it's assurance. Um, the normal way of attaching a propeller like this to a threaded shaft is to use a lock nut, and that's what this brass nut here is. So when you when you um, twist the prop onto the shaft, you tighten it as hard as you can, and then you use the lock nut to apply pressure back onto the propeller, and that applies pressure to the threads, which creates more friction, which means it's less likely that the propeller's gonna come off. Now that normally would be absolutely fine, but there's a few reasons why I want the assurance. Firstly, there's not that many turns on the propeller shaft, and that's not the prop fault of the propeller shaft. I cut this to length. That's because I couldn't go any deeper in the propeller without bursting out the other side and then ruining the aesthetics of the propeller. So there's not enough turns for me to be happy that there's going to be enough friction there to keep the propeller on the shaft. Um, secondly, in my experience, propellers come off the shafts even with lock nuts. And that's because, with the best will in the world, model boats will sail through patches of weed and stuff like that, and the weed will clog up on the propeller and cause it to get spun off the shaft. Um, and I just don't think it's worth the risk. If I lose this, I'm not going to find another one. You know, it's, the, um, it's from the Pontos upgrade kit. If I lose it, I'm not going to find another propeller like it, because no one's going to be selling them, because they're not going to use them in their kits. Um, so I'll have to find a similar diameter propeller. So I'm going to use some Loctite uh, and hopefully that will that will do the job. There's a third reason for doing this as well and that is that the propeller is made of brass which is not a particularly strong metal and I'm a bit concerned about over tightening the propeller onto the shaft and ending up stripping the threads from the propeller. Um, by using the Loctite it removes the need to apply as much force. Right, so here we are. Just going to apply a bit of thread lock in there into the hole in the propeller, and a little bit. Onto the threads. There we are, you see. Make sure that it's tight on the shaft. It's still important to remember that the lock nut here is our primary means of keeping everything in place. And really, the thread lock is just insurance. There we are. Wipe off the excess. And that will dry. As you see now, when I turn the shaft, hopefully that won't ever come off. And there we go, the props are on. I think they look really nice actually. They, the bit that I need to work out is um, how to disguise the brass nut, and I think I'll probably just paint that the same um, because. The only time these will be coming off is if there's a big issue with the boat and at that point I'll be happy enough to repaint anyway. But no, they look really good. So the next job I'm going to show is how I cast my extra collapsible lifeboats in resin. So what I'm doing here is I'm using this stuff, alginate impression powder. Um, it's essentially the same thing that dentists use to... Um, to form castings of people's mouths. Uh, and I'm going to use it <clears throat> to, um, 
to form a cast casting for these Engelhart lifeboats so I can produce two more. Crikey, it's weird stuff. So while that mould is setting up, I'll get my resin poured out and mixed thoroughly. So it's a two-part standard epoxy resin, which dries clear, which in this case is totally irrelevant because I'm going to paint it. Um, this is a one-to-one -one ratio, so one part One part resin to one part hardener. And if I'm honest, I don't need a huge amount in this case. And I prefer not to waste it, so if I need to mix up more, that's fine. But... So that was the resin, now the hardener. Give this a quick mix. Well, I say a quick mix. All right, let's have a look at this casting, see if it's worked. I tell you what, it's weird stuff. It's gone very, very solidly rubbery. It's, well, it's just bizarre, frankly. Crikey. Look at that. That's actually quite good. I mean, you know, I wasn't doubting myself, but I was doubting myself because I didn't think it was going to be very good. My word. All right, let's pour this stuff. Uh, sorry if I don't get a very good view, but I really do need to get this right. Of course, the other thing I don't know as yet is if the resin will have some form of reaction with the alginate, which is entirely possible. So this is all a bit of a learning curve and we will see how we go as we go, I guess. Right, we're about 12, 13 hours into the cure now. Um, it's difficult to tell how we're doing, really. Um, I can't actually even tell what the surface finish will be like. It looks okay. 
but I'm a little bit concerned by the um, the mould going pink again because uh, the instructions suggested that it should stay white. So um, that may just be the moisture coming from the resin, but uh, I guess it's just a bit of a waiting game. I'm gonna have to wait another few hours and then demold it and see what the results are on the other side because really the other sides are the important bit. Okay, it's now time to demould my lifeboat castings. Uh, ignore the cuts in the mould, that was just me messing around with a knife. So, let's see how we go. Frankly, they come out very easily. There is one. Clearly there has been some form of reaction with the uh, the mould and the resin. Sorry, I thought I was holding it in front of the camera, so there we are. So it's a bit cloudy in places, but what might be necessary is for me to do a coat of paint. Because um, it's only really, I find, when you actually have a coat of paint Oh God, that came out easily. It's only really when you have a coat of paint that you find out um, how good a quality the cast is. Because with this multicolour, it's very difficult to work out the surface finish. There are definitely some occlusions. I don't know if you can see these on the video. There's definitely some like bubbles on the surface. However, I think that's probably my fault. Um, again, I don't know if you can see on the video, but um, there are some bubbles, they're more obvious here, you know, it's like uh, that one there, one there, one there, one there. Um, and I think that's down to me not mixing the alginate compound well enough at the start. So it's probably a little bit of me rather than anything on the fault of either the resin or the cast. But... Um, what I'll do is I'll clean these up, I'll file them down to the final shape that I want. So I'm going to have to file the top off this to make it look like it's got a cover on it. And I'll give it a coat of white paint uh, and I'll see if it's a surface finish that I'm happy with or whether we're going to have to go again. So here they are now with paint on. Um, when I was filing down I tried to do some sort of cuts in the top to try to make it look like the canvas cover was was rippled, you know, um, and I think they've come out quite well. Um, the underside of the boats, th there are quite obviously imperfections in these, um, and the details aren't as crisp as I would like them. You know, like the keel, for example, looks quite, it, it looks a bit undefined, a bit blurry almost, you know, um, so that's a bit disappointing. Whether you will actually notice any of this I don't know, because bear in mind these boats are going to be underneath another boat covered by gunnels and stuff like that. So whether this will be at all visible will remain to be seen. So I think what I'll do for now is I'll keep them for now. Uh, and once I'm at the point where I'm putting lifeboats on the decks, I'll make an assessment whether I'm going to recast and go again or use these. So that's it for this video. I feel like I've made quite a lot of progress recently. So it seems like a good place to stop. Um, I will get another video out, hopefully, uh, in, a, in a week or two. We'll see. Um, but yeah, that's it for now. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or anything, just whack them down below, and I'll do my best to answer them. And um, yeah, if you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.